time you have cried through the night? When is the last time you've asked God to hear your voice? When is the last time you've prayed before the morning dawn awakens? When is the last time that you've prayed uh, before night and went to bed with God's word meditating on your heart? When is the last time you've cried out in a, a weeping cry from your whole heart? God, oh God, hear my voice. In the depths of your despair, in the circumstances that seem to be overwhelming you, you're wondering if there's any relief or any hope to come. You're concerned and wondering if the light at the end of the tunnel is an oncoming train. You've come to a place of maybe depression, even deep depression. Have you taken time to cry out with your whole heart? We've been looking at the heart lately. We started off with the challenge to our church on New Year's Eve, uh, the December 31st that night. Blessed are the pure in heart. They, for they shall see God. Verse 8 of chapter 5, Matthew's Beatitudes. Then we came back on February the 11th and we looked at search me, O God, and know my thoughts and know my heart. Last week we looked at hiding God's word in our hearts so that we won't sin against God. So you see, when we get a pure heart, when we ask God to search us and to cleanse our heart, then we make a, a, a vow in our lives to hide God's word in our heart so that we won't sin before God and against God. Now we're ready. Now we're ready to come before the Lord with our whole heart, with a pure heart, with a searched heart, with a clean heart, with a new heart, and with God's word in our heart. And the psalmist finds himself in that situation. Psalms chapter 119, beginning in verse number 145. This is the 19th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it's the letter Q, by the way. Only three more to go. We're at near the end of this longest chapter in the Bible. The longest verses of 176. Divided into 22 uh, paragraphs, you might say, or sections of the 22 alphabets of the Hebrew alphabet. And letters. And so we come to the psalmist finding here crying with his whole heart. Folks, sometimes we just got to cry out to God. And sometimes it's in the middle of the night. Sometimes it's in the early morning hours before the dawn awakens. Sometimes it's before we close our eyes and sleep uh, in our homes and on our beds as we cry out unto the Lord with our whole heart. We find the psalmist in this situation. And so we're going to take a look at it this morning as we take a look at the adverse circumstances that continue to be opposing uh, the, the, the psalmist here and, and upon his life. And, and he still is raising his voice in cries of desperate appeal to God. And here we see him crying unto the Lord. Here we're going to see him calling unto the Lord. And here we're going to see him confessing to the Lord. So let's take a look at it as we read it together. Psalms 119, beginning in verse number 40, 145. I cried, church, with my whole heart. Look what his cry was, real simple. Hear me, O Lord, I will keep thy statutes. I cried unto thee, save me, and I shall keep thy testimonies. I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried. Notice three times in three verses he cried. There's no doubt he's in trouble. And I cried, I hoped in thy word. Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. Hear my voice according to thy loving kindness. O Lord, quicken me according to to thy judgment. They draw nigh that follow after mischief. They are far from the law. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are true. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. May we pray together. 
Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful passage of Scripture. We thank you for the encouragement it is going to be to our hearts. We thank you for the truth of it. We thank you for the comfort of it. And Lord, we pray that we'll certainly apply it in our lives and we can learn something from the psalmist who shares this with us today from your word. Lord, we've all been in his situation. We've all had circumstances sometimes that overwhelmed us. We've all uh, became, become destitute and sometimes desperate and, and yes, even depressed. And, and Lord, we cry out unto you, hear my voice, O God. God, hear our voice today as we cry out to you. May your Holy Spirit come now and teach us and guide us into truth. Help your servant now in this hour. We thank you for your anointing that you provide for us. We thank you for your wisdom you give to us. Give us illumination insight into the word today. And may you have your will and way in this place. Father, we pray that you would save souls for Jesus today. Not only here, but abroad and around the world as the gospel of Jesus Christ goes out. And Father, we'll thank you for it and give you praise for it. In Jesus' wonderful and matchless name, amen and amen. Let's take a look, first of all, at the psalmist crying unto the Lord. Notice again in verse number 145. I cried, and how did he cry, church? With his whole heart. You got to understand, that's coming from down inside deep. That's from his very being, from his very soul, as he's crying out unto the Lord because of the circumstances he finds his life in that seem to be overwhelming him. The enemy is closing in on him. And church, that enemy can be anything or anybody. You know, what enemy today may be closing in on you today that you need to cry out unto the Lord? And so he cries, uh, and uh, and in here, I believe he gives us three things we can see in these first couple of verses here uh, concerning his crying. And I want you to notice the first one. I want you to notice how fervent he was in his crying. How fervent he was in his crying. Now, there are many kinds of cries, amen? And I I looked that up a little bit, did a search, typed it in, Googled it, and said, what type of crying do we have? And I found three that I thought were very uh, interesting and, and that they compare, and they use a child as an example. So let's take a look and consider the first cry. And as I thought more about it, I said, forget about the kids. The bigger kids are just as bad. The first kind of cry that we see is one of what we call a bad temper cry. Oh, some of you went, ooh. How many of you got a bad temper cry this morning? A little child uh, after birth that doesn't take him long or she long to learn that they are a child of Adam. And that no matter how tiny they are, they haven't inherited a sin nature. And that little fellow, I'll use the little fellow, and you know what I'm talking about, and that applies to some of you big fellows. That little guy will reach back, and pretty soon those cheeks puff out. That lip begins to quiver. His face turns red as a beet. Those little hands come up in the air at his feet, and you'd better get ready for the most deafening sound that's going to come out like you've never heard. And boy, he commenced to screaming and hollering. And only by God's grace can you stand the sound of it because the decibel's about 110 minus dB that would deafen anyone. And the best way to learn that is just ignore it. And eventually, uh, he begins to learn that that doesn't work anymore. If you can stand it. Now, some of you are laughing because some of you are still the same way. You've got a bad temper. And when you do, you get red. Your hands come up. Look at some of you looking at each other and elbowing. And all of a sudden, a sound comes out that is so deafening. And, you know, and, and all that little guy is doing is trying to let everybody know and get his attention to who he is. And by the way, you and I are a child of Adam. And we haven't inherited a sin nature from Adam. And some of you want to let loose and let everybody know and get your attention. And so there's the bad temper cry. I trust some of you have that, and that's not the one that our psalmist here has. Well, then there's one I found that is called the peevish, P-E-V-I-S-H, peevish cry. Oh, and that this one is the, the whining. Oh, look at you laughing now. The <laughs> nagging, the cry of a child who is bored. 
or miserable or sulking because he didn't get what he wanted. Any of you like that here today? I see some big smiles on people. I wish I had the camera up here today, Steve, taking a shot of, of the faces and expressions that are being shown this morning. And some of you are trying to wipe the smile off. Some of you are trying to frown. It's not going to work. You just didn't get your what you wanted. You didn't get your Mercedes or Lamborghini or Maserati for Christmas. Oh, my. And you don't mind having, letting everybody know you're whining and naked. You're bored and miserable and sulking in your tears. What I say to that, get a life. <laughs> Cut it out, knock it off. Amen? There's a third kind of cry, and I see that one here with our psalmist. And that's the same kind that a child has and that you have. And that's the cry of pain, the painful cry. That's when the child is really hurting. Something's really hurting him. He's frightened. He's scared. And I want to tell you something. That's the kind of cry that gets immediate attention. And the psalmist has that kind of cry. And he's trying to get God's immediate attention. Are you with me? How do I know that? Because I cried with my whole heart that's the way to get God's attention amen so we find that and I want you to notice also there in that verse he puts his promise into his prayers do you see that look at the promise he puts his promise into his prayer what is his prayer it's real simple about four words there hear my voice O God can't get any much briefer than that can you and it's from his whole heart and with tears and he's crying out and he needs God's attention but he adds a little bit of promise there with it. He said, I will keep thy, what church, statutes. So he throws in his promise and we can sometimes call that a vow, an oath, if you please, and that's what it is here. And I want to tell you something, folks, if you make a vow unto the Lord, you'd better keep it. If you make a promise unto God, you'd better keep it. Keep it. Now, you, and if you say it in good, all good intentions, but don't keep it, yet guess what? You're not pulling anything over the Lord because He knows your heart. He sees your heart. He knows the intent of your heart. He knows the secrets of your heart. He knows the thoughts of your heart. But here, the psalmist was about as real as real as he could get, and he said, "God, oh God, hear my voice, and I will keep your commandments, your statutes, your precepts, your values." So he puts a little promise with his prayer. And so we see this as he prays. We're learning how to pray from our heart this morning. Because you see, we're all going to go through these things. What I see in here too, I see the emotional part of him. He says, I am desperate. I see where he says, rescue me. Then I see the volitional here. I see where he says, I am determined, rule me. That's when he says, I will, that's determination, and I will keep your statutes, you see. That's, I want God, I want you to rule over me. When's the last time you prayed like that? The majority in here don't want anybody ruling over them. Got quiet. But the Bible says we're to obey them that have the rule over us. The Bible says we're to obey the government. Hello. Hello. We're to obey those of God that are in place of authority, in a position of authority. That means our bosses. That means our, our superintendents. That means our foremans and, super, and, and everything else, wherever we may work. The office managers, you see. It also means the church. God has placed men in, in a place of authority. And the Bible says to obey them that have the authority or the rule over you. So this psalmist already had a, a, a really good understanding of that because he's praying, God, hear my voice. I want you to know I make a promise. I will keep your statutes and I am determined to do so. And I want you, I want your statutes. That's when he said, when I, when I want to keep your statutes, I want to keep your commandments. I want to keep your word. God, I want your word to rule over me. What a prayer. Most of us want to rule over ourselves and rule over everybody else. There's only one 
thing in your home you get to rule over. That's the dog. Or the kitty cat. For those of you that got birdies. And you get to rule over your kids. Amen. But God needs to rule over you and I. You got to understand, you go back and read the entire Psalm 119, you'll find the whole thing through that, all 176 verses. Whoever was the writer of Psalms 119 is going through some very difficult times in their life. And it's constantly about the enemy overwhelming them, taking them over uh, after them. And, and it gets down here to, the, to Psalm 145 through 152. We're getting down close to the three quarters of the Psalm. Now we're through it. We're, we're down to the 19th letter of the alphabet, of the Hebrew alphabet. And he cries out in deepness from the cry of his heart and, and just simply. And that's what we need to do sometimes. Some of you need to go out in this ball field sometime by yourself. Some of you need to just slump over in the steering wheel in your car at night when you drive up in the driveway and just simply cry out, hear my voice, O oh God. And by the way, he's the only one who can. And so we see the psalmist here as he cries out. So we see his fervent, how fervent he was from his heart. Then I want you to notice how frustrated he was. I want you to notice how frustrated it was. Verse 146, again, he repeats it. I cried unto thee. Now, instead of uh, uh, here, he says, hear me, O Lord. He says, "Uh, uh, save me, rescue me, and I shall keep thy testimonies. See, he repeats himself in the second psalm there. And by the way, you go back to what he's doing here. You see, and I want you to notice, this is not repetition or vain praying. Okay, that's not what he's talking about here. You see, what he's doing, he's making an oath unto God. And the reason why he repeats this same thing, basically, as he makes this oath unto God, because in the Old Testament, in Bible days, if you were to make a very serious oath or vow or promise unto God, you were required to have two or three witnesses present to establish every word of the truth in the oath that you make to God to make sure everything's just right and there's accountability. But since he didn't have nobody around him, he comes back in the next verse and he repeats his own oath assuring God that I mean what I say. I keep my word, God. I'm going to keep your statutes. I'm going to keep your testimonies. And God, I want you to hear my voice. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Amen. So we see the emotional here of his prayer. He said, I'm desperate. God, rescue me. Then we see the volitional of his prayer. He says, I am determined for you to rule over me. That's in the first one, how, uh, how fervent he was. Now, how frustrated he was. He repeats that same phrase. And it's not a, a vain repetition. It's a validating. He's validating the oath that he's making unto the Lord here. He's validating his own oath before the Lord. And again, he promises that he will keep God's word. How many of you have made that promise and gone back on it? Yellow. Time to get honest. How many of us made a pledge or a promise or an oath or a a vow to the Lord and we haven't kept it? God will hold you accountable to it. Better to pay the vow than not to, the scripture says. And I think that's a good vow or a good oath to make. God, I'm going to keep your word. I'm going to keep your statutes. I'm going to keep your testimonies. I'm going to keep your precepts and your principles in this book. What an awesome vow to make. And you say, well, that's just because he's desperate. No. Remember, he's crying from his whole heart. He's not pulling strings here with God. He's not making, let's make a deal. You want that, go to the Price is Right. And you can watch it on the Price is Right on TV, let's make a deal. No, this is a solemn oath coming from the depths of his heart. And folks, sometimes you may wonder, where is God in all of this? Is God listening? Is God hearing? Oh, he does, but sometimes he's just silent. But sometimes God needs to see just how desperate we are. Sometimes he needs to see just how real we are. How serious are we? And so there's no doubt in this psalmist, he's in deep trouble, and he needs God's help. And as you read Psalm 119 and start back from the beginning, you'll see how there's this constant uh, uh, of the enemy, and he's constantly approaching the Lord. So we get down to three-fourths of the end of the psalm here of 119, and boy, now he's really letting it out from his whole heart. Sometimes, church, we need to pray with our whole heart and get serious before the Lord. So he was frustrated. He repeats it. But I want you to see how forward he was. He was forward in his prayer. Look at verse 147 with me. Third time we see the the phrase cry here. He said, I prevented 
the dawning of the morning. Now the word prevented there means to anticipate. I anticipated the dawning of the coming of the morning. And also another word that can be used for it is forestalled. He said, I literally prevent, uh, anticipated the coming of the morning, but also forestalled it at the same time because I needed to talk to God before the sun came up. When's the last time you've woken out of sleep and talked to God before the daylight? You remember when we talked about the rooster, David? The rooster, he likes to get up in the morning and really strut. And he starts his crowing. Now, you all think that's because he's, uh, you know, the boss of the, the herd of the harem of his lady friends and wants to strut around or he just wants to hear himself cackle. But, you know, really, the rooster, while he's doing that, is he wants to let the girl, he thinks he's letting the girls know that the sun is waiting for him to crow to come up. We need to get along with God sometimes and cry out in the morning before the sun rises. His prayer, his cry was persistent. He knocked, he kept on knocking. Matter of fact, he came to the point where he literally pestered God's throne. When's the last time you've pestered God's throne for something? And you kept on knocking. I want to, he, he describes here how, how forward he was in his prayer. Let's take a look at it with me here in verse number 47, 147. Look how, um, how he was with this, his forwardness. He was praying before the rising in the morning. When he said, the word he used there, prevented, it means to anticipate or to forestall. And this was the third time that he cried in three verses. There can be no doubt he was in trouble. Amen. The only sad thing that he said there was he said, I hope in thy word. That's the sad part of it. Now, church, I want to tell you, you may be praying and you may be crying out. And you may be even saying, God, I, I, I'm trying to hope in your word. I'm trying to count on your word today, Lord. I, I, I'm doing the best I can, and I've been going for a long time. And God, you have seemed just to be silent in this matter. I mean, anybody been there? God, where are you? God may be silent, but he's never absent. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will stick closer to you than a brother. You may be crying out this morning, and you begin, you're trying to stand on the authority of God's word, and nothing's happening, nothing's moving. And so you begin to hope in God's word, some kind of hope that something's happening. And you're, God, where are you? Why is heaven silent this morning? I don't understand it. Hey, listen, folks, God may be silent for a moment or for a time, but he's never absent. He's always there, even in the darkest time, even in the depths of the boat, and it's filling up with water, and it's about to sink, and the winds are about to sink. God is still there. He may be in the still small voice. He may be walking on the sea, headed your way, but don't worry. He'll show up right on time. Don't you give up. You don't need to hope in God's word. You need to trust in God's word. You need to believe in God's word. Even when things aren't moving as fast as you want them to. As they weren't for this psalmist at the time. You see. Oh, you see, look at the verses. I shared some verses with you I thought might help you in this. With my soul, Isaiah says, have I desired thee when, church? In the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee when? Early. Sometimes you got to get up early before the dawn. Sometimes you got to get up early before the rooster crows. Look at the next one. Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Psalm 63, 1. Let's take a look at another one. Proverbs 8, 17. Solomon writing, about God says, I love them that love me. And those that seek me early what church shall find me sometimes you got to prevent the dawn from coming up and get ahead of it and talk to God this was how forward he was in his prayer remember he was fervent he cried from his whole heart he was frustrated he had to repeat it twice now that's not repetition vain praying okay and sometimes we feel like we got to tell God over and over again God heard it the first time God's not deaf you understand that God's ear is not close to us. 
I thought about this where the psalmist is crying out, hear me, oh God, oh God, hear my voice. And I thought about that as there's times I've done that in my own life. And I said, wow, just think about this now. There are 7.6 billion people on this planet and crying out to God. Now, we won't get into the saved and the lost and all that, who hears what. But let's just take uh, 2 billion people that are saved for sure that we know. Let's just take that figure. Can you imagine two, bill, two billion believers are praying at the same time? And then so you're crying out, God, hear my voice. Forget the other 199.99 billion and hear my voice, oh God. Because certainly my circumstances, my trial, my desperation, my what I'm going through is more far greater than all of theirs. Aren't you glad that I don't care if it's all 7.6 billion people praying at the same time. God can still hear your voice. But you've got to call out. You've got to cry out. And maybe sometimes those that cry a little louder get the attention. Hello. How many of you know that when you get around all these little guys and gals, these little babies and they start? It's the same thing with you big babies. Usually the one who cries the loudest gets the attention. The one who squeaks the loudest gets the grease on the wheel. Amen? Thank you, Brother David. He knows about gre- greasy stuck bearings and axles. How about you guys at work on What do you do when the squeak, it starts squeaking? You grease it up. Amen? Pull it out, take the, bearings of all, take the bearings out and grease them and pack them with grease, put them back on, spin it on the axle, put it back on, and all of a sudden it's smooth and going great, and the noise seems to stop. But it still continues to squeal and holler until you pay attention to it. Sometimes you're going to have to cry out and scream out if you have to from your heart. God knows your heart. Don't get frustrated. If you do, then don't mind telling God again and again. The Bible says if you keep asking and keep knocking, guess what? It'll be open and you'll get it. So the one who cries the loudest gets it. The baby who cries the loudest gets the candy. Look at some of you smiling and laughing. You know what I'm talking about. Be sure to give them Tootsie Roll Pops when they get bigger. Because there's always something to treat inside the candy. Or the blow gums. I like the blow pops. Those big old blow pops. They're really great. You just you work on that thing for a long time. They're big. They're like golf balls. And you just work on that old blow pop and blow pop. Pretty soon that old hard candy begins to dissolve and dissolve. And what's left? This nice, sweet, full of sugar, soft chewing gum. And you get to chew on it for about three minutes or two minutes, and then it turns as hard as the golf ball. You see? And you've got to spit the thing out. Now, now they're smart in doing that because they want you to get another one. Hello. Amen. So watch, look, look what else in his, in his forwardness, in his prayer. Not only was he willing to get up before the rising of the morning and pray to God, but look at this in, in the next verse, in verse 148. My eyes prevent, in other words, they anticipate, they forestall the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. Okay, look what the scripture says. Let my prayer, Psalms 114 too, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and then the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. I wrote here in my notes, he says, here's what I think would happen. Sometimes uh, he turned, the psalmist at this time, he turned to those moments before sleep. And came into, before sleep came into good use. How many think sleep gives you some good use? There, there is some good use in sleep, amen? He composed himself for sleep by prayerfully turning over the word of God in his mind. Are you getting this? He went to bed with the Word of God on his mind. He purposed in his heart, I'm going to meditate on God's Word before sleep takes over. Even though sleep has some good use to it and is beneficial and I need it. But what's far greater is that I go to bed with the Word of God on my heart and on my mind and meditate on the Word. Some of you are staying up too late watching all this garbage on television of all this crime and killing and you name it and murdering and gory stuff and then you go to bed that way and you wonder why you toss and turn and roll and can't go to sleep because your mind is full of nothing but bad things. Now I'm just being honest. You want God to move, then you better start applying what this guy did. Here's a good example for us to learn from. Go to bed tonight meditating on the Word of God. We let God put us to sleep at night. 
We listen to headsets, put Alexander Scorby on, and, and listen to him read the scriptures until you just fall asleep. Get the one that has the animals in it and all that stuff and the sound effects. That's really cool. Go to bed meditating on the Word of God. You know what I went meditating on last night, to bed? I went to bed meditating on last night. Hide the Word of God in thy heart that I might not sin against thee. I listened to this loudmouth preacher for a whole hour. I wanted to go to bed. I was tired. And 19 minutes into it, I got up and got ready to go to bed, and the phone rang. I said, I knew it. Got his name and address and everything. I sat back down. I said, well, if that's one, there's another one coming. And went to bed meditating on the word of God. See, it doesn't matter who preaches and teaches as long as it's truth and right. It's God's word. See, that's, what, that's how forward he was with his prayer. Man, he, went, he went to bed with God's word on it. So we've seen uh, his crying. Let's look at his calling real quickly. Verses 149 through 151, we see the psalmist calling here. And, and first of all, we see his simple plea. He describes his simple plea. Look what he says. Hear my voice. Now, that's not hard, is it? What a simple plea. Hear my voice. Matter of fact, the word hear there, uh, there and that word, it, it implies here, the word hear uh, is emphatic. It means, oh, do hear. God, oh, do hear my voice as he's calling out unto the Lord. See, he cried, now he's calling. Okay, he's calling, hear my voice. And he tells us in here as he begins to describe it. So there's his plea, but I I added some things here. I want you to notice in the verse there, look at the verse with me. Hear my voice, 149, hear my voice. Now notice how that word hear there means, oh, do hear. Hear my voice, how, church? According unto thy loving kindness. So the first thing he wants God to do, he wants God to respond in loving kindness. He wants God to respond in love. I had and wrote a few other things down. In other words, church, he based his plea on the loving kindness of God. He asked for God to hear my voice. And by the way, only God is the one who could. Amen. He did. Oh, do hear. And he has no doubt that God can. How many of you believe that? So there was his simple plea. But he not only wanted God to respond in loving kindness, but notice what else. He wanted God to respond with life. With life. Look at the word he says. Are you there with me? He uses the word, the same word we use in the New Testament, where Paul talks about the, the Spirit of God will quicken one. All right, it means to make alive. Look at this. Oh, Lord, quicken me according to thy judgment, according to thy word. God, I want you to make me alive. Watch this. He's crying out to the God. Hear my prayer, Lord. All right. I want you to hear my voice. Okay. I want you to respond to me with loving kindness. And I want you to make me alive, quicken me, so that I can hear what you have to say to me concerning my circumstances. That's what it means. Y'all praying that way? I hope so. Quicken me according to thy word. You see, you're not going to hear God's word until you're alive. You're not going to hear God's word until the Spirit of God has quickened you and made you alive in Christ. And then when we're saved, you need to let the Spirit of God quicken you to hear what God has to say. We turn a deaf ear too often and too much to the Lord. See, we all do the praying, and we never stop to hear the listening. See, when you cry and ask God to hear your voice, okay, now it's time to listen. And let God respond. And he says, God, please respond to me in your loving kindness. And by the way, I want you to quicken me. Make me alive so, with, your, with thy word so that I can hear what you have to say to me. We've got to know what God has to say to us. Now, we can do all the praying, but then you see you've got to get into God's word for God to tell you what he wants to say. And the answer. So he asks the Lord to respond with him in life. Then I want you to notice in verse 150 with me. I want you to see his plight here. His sudden plight. He's got a plight. Look at verse 50 says. They draw nigh that follow after mischief. This is the enemy that's after him. And they are far from thy law. In other words, he's saying my enemies are near and far. They're near to me, but they're far from you, God. And he's not telling them that he's far. they're far from him in miles. They're far from him in malice. 
because he mentions the word mischief. You got some enemies after you today, folks? Do you? See, they, they had long departed from God's law in, ma- in, in malice. So there's his sudden plight. He, he tells what's happening. But then I want you to notice in verse 151, he comes back and he describes a safe place. How many of you want a safe place? Oh, this is when the enemy's after you, folks. This is when the devil's after you. And believe me, the devil will get after you. Learn something from this. Look at this. They draw nigh that follow after mischief. They are far from me. Look at verse 151. Here we go. Here's his safe place. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. When he talks about statutes and precepts and commandments and all of that, he's talking about God's word. He said, God, your word is near. Your word is truth. And the enemy is approaching. The enemy is trying to destroy me. The enemy is trying to come in the hand. It's trying to destroy my home, destroy my life, destroy my marriage. I want to tell you, destroy my kids. The enemy is out there, folks. And I want to tell you, carnal weapons aren't going to defeat it. It's going to take spiritual weapons. And that's the word of God that's going to help you to defeat the enemy. And I want to tell you, when they're pressing in on you, the only safe place you can be is in the arms of Jesus. The only safe place where you're going to get protection is in God's Word. God's Word is going to protect you. Remember last week? How do we protect ourselves from sin? Hide the Word of God in our heart that we might not sin against God. And there are going to come those times when you feel like everything's closing in on you and the enemy around you is destroying everything that you love and cherish and so forth and it's just closing in. You've got to find you a safe place. You've got to find you a hiding place in the Word of God. And here's the good thing about it with me, folks. This is, this is awesome. Don't you ever forget this. You see, and he realized that at this point in time that no one could, no one could protect him but God himself. And I want to tell you something, when the enemy closes in, here's what's great. No matter who the enemy is, I don't care if it's the devil himself that's trying to get at you, or your home, or your mind, or your heart, or your family. They cannot touch you till they first have to pass through God Almighty. The enemy can never touch you unless God allows it. Take Job for instance. The devil couldn't touch Job until God gave him permission. And the devil can't touch you unless God says so. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Didn't say that weapons wouldn't form, but they won't prosper. You need a hiding place. You better get into God's word and let God's word protect you. And before the enemy can touch you, they got to pass through God first. That's comfort, folks. I don't know what you're going through this morning or what you're facing or what's happening in your life and you feel like it's all crumbling or coming down and you're depressed, you're overwhelmed with circumstances and everything that's happening. I want to tell you something. And all that's the enemy. All of that's the enemy. But I want to tell you something. It cannot hurt you. It cannot harm you until it is first sifted through the will of God, until it goes through the permission of God Almighty because He's a sovereign God. He's in control. He's in rule. I'm His child. I'm His son. You're His daughter. And nothing going to touch you unless God lets it. If God does this for a reason, it's for a purpose, it's for lessons, and it's always to bring him glory and honor and give glory to the Lord. So the psalmist, he finds a safe place in the word of God. Now we come to the last verse. So we've seen him crying. He cries with his whole heart. He cries fervently. He cries frustrated. He cries forward. Then we see him uh, where he's calling out unto the Lord, and he just has a simple plea. Then he gives God, he tells him his sudden plight that's come against him as if God didn't know. And then he tells him there's a safe place to hide, and that's in the Word of God. Now look at his confessing. Here's his confessing in verse number 152. Ah, concerning thy testimonies, that's God's precepts, God's law, his word. Concerning thy word, I have known Now notice, I have known, he says, of old, that thou hast founded them forever. What what did he learn? What was he confessing? That God's word was forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall abide forever. He learned that God's word was forever. And that's why you can hide in God's word this morning, no matter what you're going through, because God's word, church, is forever. Look at the last word. I circled in my Bible. Key word there. 
I, thou has founded, God, you have founded your precepts. God, you have founded your law. God, you have founded your principles. God, you have founded your precepts. God, you have founded your testimonies forever. Now, folks, when we talk about forever, forever is forever. And I want you to learn something about this forever. First of all, I want you to know forever takes us back a very long way. Matter of fact, forever takes us back before what Moses was given the law. Forever takes us back before creation, before God created the heavens and the earth. The Word of God was there. Forever takes us back a long way. Even in eternity past, God's Word was there. In the beginning, God created. You see, God's Word was already there. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God has always been. There's never been a time He has not. There's never a time where He will never be. You see, He's always been there, even from way back and way back. Hallelujah. Praise God. The psalmist said, God, I know Your Word has been forever and forever. And they were established before even creation. They were established before the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, before Adam and Eve ever walked on this planet. Oh, you see, they were established before Moses got the law, before Noah got in the ark. They were all God's word forever. And I'm going to trust in that. That's what he said. I found it. That's what he says here. I have known. Wow, that's... Now, how would he know that when we get to Psalms, when the word's already been written for probably over 3,000 years by the time this came out? How did he know God's word was forever? Isn't that interesting? You know how he knew it? Faith. Faith. By faith. Notice what else he says. Now when we talk about forever, not only does it take us way back a long ways, but it takes us way ahead. Forever takes us way ahead. It takes us, it takes us on ahead a very long way. Let me tell you how far it's going to take us. It's going to take us far beyond what else is yet still to come. God's word is going to take us past the rapture of the church. Hello. God's word's going to take us past the tribulation. God's word's going to be past the millennium. God's word's going to be past eternity past. There will always be God's word, even eternity, even when we go into the eternal state. God's word will already be there. Because God is forever. Now that's something, folks, you can trust in, you can rely on, you can hide yourself in, and you can put your faith in it. I wrote some things for you there and we're done. Look at this. On forever on, as long as there is a God in heaven forever. Amen? That is how long God's Word will endure forever. God's Word founded before time was will be firm and changeless when time shall be no more. Such is the Word of God. And the psalmist confesses his faith in that Word. Have you confessed your faith today in the Word? And the Word is Jesus Christ. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Have you put your faith and trust in that Word today? Jesus is the Word. I ask you, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul wrote about it in a little different light in the book of Corinthians. He talks about us building, our faith in building. And he said, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He, Peter's the little rock, but Christ is the massive, solid rock of Gibraltar. You remember there was an assurance company out for a long time, wrote a commercial, and they said, get a piece of the rock. Get you some insurance coming, a piece of the rock. For church, those of you that are watching my tell, you want some insurance? Oh, I give you some insurance. Get a piece of the rock. God offers you today a piece of the rock, and the rock is Jesus Christ. Are you willing to come to him and put your faith in the rock? Are you willing to put your faith in the word today? Because Jesus is the word. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Oh, praise God. You can have a piece of the word today. You can have a piece of the rock today, and it's not the insurance company. It's Jesus Christ. He'll give you insurance that'll take you on through eternity. And for on, forever, 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 and forever. Because you have a piece of the Word. You have a piece of the rock. The Lord Jesus Christ. The psalmist says, no matter how my circumstances are, church, I'm going to put my faith in the Word of God. No matter what I'm going through, 
I don't know where you're at today, church. I don't know what's going on in your life, the circumstances you're facing, going through, the trials may be dark. The hour may be dark. You may be desperate. You may be depressed. You may be down. You may think that, oh, God's not listening. Where's heaven? Well, do what this psalmist did. Cry out from your whole heart. Get in it before the morning. Get in it before the evening. If you take that morning and evening, you know what we would call that today? An old-fashioned quiet time. You got to have to have a quiet time with God and cry out from your heart today and trust God. Those of you that are watching by television now, listening on the radio, the internet, iPhones, tablets, pads, no matter where you're at around the world, or right here in our city of Ocala, Marion County, Central Florida, now's the time to put your faith and trust in the Word. And the Word is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God desires for you to do that today, friend. And you can do it right now. No matter where you're watching this from, where you're listening to it from, it doesn't matter if it's even around the world. You can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And then you can begin to cry out unto God with your whole heart. Be assured that God is listening. He hears. Oh, friend, he may be silent, but he's not absent. Why not come to Christ today? Put your faith and trust. The psalmist was willing to put his faith, all of his faith, everything that he had, his whole heart, in the Word of God. Why not put your faith today and trust in that same Word, who is the Lord Jesus Christ? We want to help you do that right now. Those of you that are sitting in this auditorium as well, if you've never made that commitment for Christ, would you be willing to do so right now? Pray with us. Pray this prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you now. It's putting your faith in this word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray this with us, dear God. That's right, go ahead. I confess, that's what the psalmist was doing. He was confessing. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord from heaven. Amen. I confess that I'm a sinner, and I've sinned against you, God. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. And he will, my friend, he will. I do now believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He took my place. He paid my sin debt. Right now, by faith, I do trust in that word. And by faith, I do now call upon the Lord Jesus. I believe he was buried, that he rose again the third day. And I call upon him right now. Come into my heart and life. Be my Lord and my Savior take me to heaven someday when I die where I can live with him for all eternity forever 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 because the word is forever and I pray this simple little prayer by faith in Jesus name amen and amen friend God bless you for those of you that prayed with us just now whether it's on the television the radio the internet all the gadgets that's out there for us. God bless you. Write us, call us. We'd love to hear from you. We've got a little gospel track we'd love to send to you absolutely free. Now that you're saved, what next? It'll help you to start your new walk and direction in life with the Lord. You can get this message on CD audio or audio or DVD absolutely free. Call us, let us know. In the meantime, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. And remember one thing. God loves you. And so do we. God bless you.